This is Father Bonaventure, and this is not another father, because I'm here by myself, but not entirely, which I'll get to. Welcome to God's Planning. Thanks for all those who support us. If you enjoy the show, please consider making a monthly donation on Patreon. Be sure to like and subscribe to God's Planning wherever you listen to your podcasts. As I said, uh, I'm the only Dominican on this show, at least the only First Order Dominican, perhaps. Um, but there is another man who's on this show with me as well. This is a guest explaining episode, and I'm delighted to have Dr. Mark Regneris, who is joining us from the University of Texas at Austin. Dr. Professor Regneris, welcome. Thank you, Father. Good to be with you. Great. Let's give a little bio for those. Who, everyone should know you, but in case there are at least one or two listeners who do not know you, um, Professor Reg. Regneris is a professor of sociology at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, his research in, is in areas of sexual behavior, family, marriage, and religion. These are exciting topics to anyone listening to this show. Uh, Dr. Professor Regneris is the author of over 40 published articles and book chapters and four books. The last two and the ones we'll be talking about today, we'll get into a little bit, uh, most recently is The Future of Christian Marriage in t- Oxford University Press 2020. There it is. Probably it's backwards, but you get the picture. Um, and then the before that, uh, cheap sex, uh, the transformation of men, marriage, and monogamy. Again, backwards, I think, but we'll see. Um, but beautiful books on on the issues of marriage, sexuality, the family. Um, he's also published and researched widely, including outlets as New Yorker, Atlantic Monthly, Christianity Today, and Wall Street Journal, and contributed to First Things National Review and Public Discourse. It is quite a record. And Professor Regneris, you are a sociologist, and I have to say, I first discovered you um, because I was leading a a course, a seminar on controversial moral issues at Providence College. Uh, And on one, we were doing books each week, and one of the weeks of the seminar was on cheap sex, uh, uh, discussing relationships and such. Um, And as I was reading the book for the seminar, uh, there was just something that struck me that I felt like I knew you in a way because I was reading this and I thought, this guy must be a Catholic convert. It was the weirdest hmm. thing. And then I said to myself, and not only is he a Catholic convert, I'll bet this guy was a Calvinist. And I went <laughs> online, as I always do, and found out that Professor Regneris is indeed a Catholic convert to Calvinism. So that made How me How did you get that from cheap sex? That's, I was, at, what I wanted to ask you is, is what do you, yeah, I, I literally, I was reading this and I thought, this is a Catholic convert. And in fact, I think this guy's a Cal- this guy was a Calvinist, you know. Like Aristotle huh. says, like is known by like. But I, so I was thinking, I don't know where to p- pin it down. Did you? I mean, did you like throw in a few John Calvin quotes or something? I don't think so. Uh, I don't think in cheap sex I had that. Uh, yeah. Except maybe I had mentioned the uh, you know where I went to college, meeting my wife there. But uh, maybe that's it. Any could case, be. Any- in any yeah. case, I don't know if anyone Wild. else can let me, any, anyone else can let us know if uh, if they discover this or feel the same way. Although it's out of the bag at this point, but it's that's a fantastic book. Before we get into talking about those those books and kind of your general things, you are a Catholic sociologist, that and is a lot of a lot of people um, think, oh, sociology, yikes, that's a strange yeah. kind of social science and it is. Um, scary one. What do you, what, what do you make of? Being a Catholic sociologist, what what do you make of sociology as a Catholic, this sort of thing? Without getting, we could spend hours talking about it, but yeah, you know, what do you make yeah. of sociology? And should people be scared of it, or interested in it, or non well, I you know, I still love the core of it and the uh, what it's good at, and sort of a kind of a sociological perspective on the world, in that we're influenced by social phenomena and social forces, etc. Powerfully so. Uh, into the reality of social institutions and how you know difficult they are to change, but change they they necessarily can. So these are all sort of basic sociological stuff. Now, American sociology is kind of a different beast and has become so in the probably the last 10, uh, 20 to thirty years. I don't know that I would get back in if uh, I did it all over again. Not because I didn't like it, but because I don't know if they would let me in. Um, the the barriers to graduate education and the kind of filtration they do is uh, pretty extensive now. I mean, kids will write me saying, okay, I, Professor, I want to study under you. I'm like, 
good luck, right? I'm not sure I can help you. You better, you know, don't say that in your application <laughs> and maybe you'll get in, right? Yeah. So it has changed. Um, and I'm not quick to use the kind of woke terms, terminology, mm -hmm. but, you know, it, it sure does have a reality out there within higher ed and certainly in, the, the, in sociology. There are yes. days when I think sociology hasn't influenced anything. And there are days when I think, oh, it, what we're seeing right now is the triumph of sociology. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it's... Uh, it's hard to tell. And, you know, what, what makes me a Catholic sociologist? I used to think there was such a thing as Christian sociology. Hmm. And maybe there is, uh, I think, it's more than just being a Catholic, because I know plenty of Catholics who've uh, mail <laughs> right. it in in terms of faith. Um, yeah. You know, in theory, it would be you're willing to wrestle with big questions that you you know you have some philosophical training some mm -hmm. philosophical understanding mm -hmm. uh and philosophical sensitivity whereas i think lots of my peers you know aren't really interested in philosophy except enacting one that they may or may not even understand the contours of yeah so i think that's some of it uh i when i was uh uh not a catholic yet I, I fell in love with aspects of Catholic social teaching. Mm -hmm. I teach, teach class at University of Texas on Catholic social doctrine to, to wow. freshmen, which is amazing. Oh, my goodness. Um, yeah. yeah. And, and so I, I like it and uh, I appreciate it. And it's nuanced and it's it's not really American in the same kind of uh, mm. way that, uh, you know, the higher ed is seems thoroughly Americanized in terms of the, the principles and priorities that we're dealing with now. So I'm not sure I know a good definition of Catholic sociologist. Yeah. No, I think that's right. I would say um, it's like, what, what is a Catholic philosopher, a Catholic mathematician? Maybe in Catholic philosophers a little more, but still, yeah, there is a unity to the discipline in itself such that mm -hmm. it's not like a Catholic should be any better at doing derivatives in mathematics or that being a Catholic biases right. you against something. I think this is one of the interesting parts about your research is, as, as listeners can tell, if they don't already know already, um, you don't mind, you don't shy away from from complicated, deep, important issues because they're important. It seems like yeah. today, like yeah. marriage, family, sex, uh, they're no-go areas, religion, these kind of things. Uh, yeah. You don't shy away from those things. And therefore, you get a cool backlash effect of people saying, well, because he's Catholic, yeah. uh, therefore... Right. And I've always thought this argument is a shame because you sh you're not allowed you're not supposed to tell anyone else your sins nor tell other people your stupidity. And when people make arguments like biased arguments like that in general terms, it seems so silly. It's like asking if, like if I try to demonstrate the existence of God, for instance, as a philosopher, and someone says, "Well, I mean, can't trust that demonstration because he's going right. to be biased because God yeah. matters." And you think, "Well, yeah. you know, don't be stupid." Um, right. but there we are. But you're right. and also I think maybe being Catholic is Maybe the topics that that you were interested in, for instance, um, because you're I mean, you're grabbing by the horns, the most important human elements. You're kind of like a JP2 sociologist, maybe um, you're grabbing on onto Fine. marriage and sex in the family, you know, love and responsibility. You're just saying, I'm going to do some empirical data work on this. Um, so in your in your book, like Cheap Sex, you talk about the uh, dating and the experience of of men and women, especially today. And you do it from a, a sociological market kind of lens. You do it from the sense of uh, imagining that it's an, it's, oh my gosh, an interchange. I mean, you do it from yeah. the sense of imagining that it marriage as our relationships are what everyone thought they were until about five minutes ago, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. So what, what, what is cheap sex? And uh, what was right. your kind of your your main point in there. I mean, I could say right. it, but I'm excited to hear what you have to sure, say. Sure, sure, sure. Well, I will say it's easier to read than love and responsibility. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> we can all agree on that, right? <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Um, I wrote that because I, you know, I have no new original thoughts. Never have. Never will. Um, but I had read a piece on sexual economics uh, mm -hmm. 15 years ago that really sort of filled in all the, all the gaps for me. And I was, had been working in this domain for a little while. 
Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, let's go collect some data and see what, what, what the deal is, what's going on right now. So we did that. Uh, the, the, the book kind of emerges from that. And, you know, the, the reason I wrote it is because it, it became obvious to me that marriage was slowing down. Mm -hmm. Is it slowing down because people don't want it? I didn't think so. I mean, I think people still mm -hmm. profess to want to marry. Yep. And yet the, the age at which marriage is, is uh, going up is, 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 you know, or the, the pace is, is, is significant. And I thought, well, do people like waiting until they're 30, 32 to marry? I think most people would say no. Mm -hmm. So why do we, why, you know, they do why are these things happening? Right. Yeah. And so yeah. um, uh, kind of going back in time to see like what, what, what has changed around technology, et cetera. And it was fairly obvious. And uh, that the, the sort of advent of uh, effective contraception Mm -hmm. just sort of injected into the, the mating market, a very different kind of dynamic such that uh, I, I talk about the, the mating market that my grandparents inhabited, right? There's plenty of premarital pregnancies. There wasn't that many premarital births, frankly. Mm -hmm. Most of them were marital births. That, you know, there's a yeah, lot of first, chil first children who were who came pretty early. Um so, but that, you know, that doesn't happen nearly so often anymore in terms of the premarital births. So what happens, you know, in the, in the 60s, especially in the 70s, like the, 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 the material happened in the 60s, but it didn't really take on uh, or take hold till I'd say even the mid 70s, perhaps. You've got a, a mating market that becomes a lot more confusing. Um, and a lot more sort of multi-dimensional. You have people in one corner of the mating market now, like interested in marriage and serious about marriage. You have other corner of the mating market where ah, they're interested in short-term relationships. And then in the middle is this kind of muddy, like we'd like to track in the one direction, but you know, well, we're not there yet. We're working in that direction. All these sorts of uh, rhetoric that people use around that. Um, but one of the key things about this mating market is it's differentiated by sex in, in, a, in a distinctive way. Like there are more men in the short-term corner of the market, more women in the long-term corner of the market, and they just exhibit different interests that uh, affect the power dynamics of the mating market a lot more than they used to, okay? Mm -hmm. In the pre-pill mating market, you know, people will, uh, you know, men would have to kind of cough up a fair amount of security uh, before she might be willing to sleep with him. It may be premarital, it may not be, but like, yeah. you know, uh, she charged a whole lot more, more yeah. right? Yeah. Well, why is it all on her? Well, because mm -hmm. if, you know, unless you're blind, ignorant, or completely sold out to some oddball ideology, men are sort of more driven by uh, sexual yeah. desire than women on average. And so mm -hmm. it means in that exchange, she holds a fair amount of power, right? Mm -hmm. Power that, you know, she doesn't feel like she holds that today. Why? Well, because uh, the monopoly or the kind of, uh, sort of uh, power sharing among women has largely broken down, mm -hmm. partly because of the pill, largely because of the pill, because now um, pregnancy can be prevented. She has lost a kind of main reason for slowing down a relationship to see where it goes and to see uh, how much he is willing to yep. commit. Okay? Yes. So that's kind of the, the, the situation where we're at. Um, and and yeah. the, this, the fact that there's more men in the one corner and more women in the other means power dynamics are quite different. In the short-term market for sex, Women have lots of power, right? They don't have to do anything. Like they can uh, they can be extremely selective because they're dramatically outnumbered, but they really generally don't want to be over there. They would like to be in the committed relationship corner or the marriage corner. Yeah. Whereas on the opposite side, you've got marriage, right? Which we as Catholics esteem. And who's in charge in the marriage corner? Well, men, because there's a lot fewer of them over there at any given point yeah. in time which means uh, she has to do a lot of this discernment. She talks about, you know, 
what can I get? Uh, you know, any, any language around settling is always women talking about it because uh, mm -hmm. they're the ones who sort of have to weigh the costs of what's in front of them versus what they had hoped for or versus what they might be able to get, maybe. Anyways, so the whole thing has injected a ton of uncertainty into yes. the relationship market. And, and uh, that's and, where we're at. And, yeah, and asymmetry. What I loved about this book and why I think it's really necessary reading, if you're listening to this and you're working with young people or anyone in the 20s and 30s, or you you are one of these people, um, is that it makes so crystal clear through personal testimony and uh, and statistics and studies what people are experiencing today in the asymmetry, the power dynamics of, of male-female relationships, such that women are actually to feel compelled to do something they don't want to do. And men have, well, it's just everything, what they, everything they want is cheap and everything a woman wants is extremely costly. What I love about it is one, that it's so clear in that way. Two is it gets to the Catholic teaching about contraception as being important and why this mattered without starting with it. Like this is yeah. not a kind of Adam and Eve in the yeah. pill argument where you just go ahead and pro prophesy. It's a sense of starting where everyone is and saying, hey, no one's really happy about this, right? We didn't bring up the pill thing, but let's go and regress to figure out what might have been here. Um, and then you, so you can, it's for an apologetic purpose of presenting Catholic teaching uh, and, and JP2's kind of model and the church's model. It has this nice personalistic human way of doing it that everyone, there's, it's not the kind of moral red flag, you know, finger pointing. You're not, you're not doing, you're doing contraception, therefore you're immoral. It's a sense of saying, hey, are you happy? I look at this stuff here. Here, I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you an explanation why you're unhappy, and I'm going to give you a possible solution to that based on this kind of stuff. So I think that's 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 extremely extremely helpful um, to the conversation. I do also wonder, <laughs> do you run this by your wife and uh, before you put these things out here? Is this like field tested? These kind of pronouncements about women and what they want. <laughs> you know. Uh... I will say this is less about this book and more about yeah. the the next book, the future of Christian marriage. To switch to, we yeah. actually have a sort of low grade disputation about <laughs> the, the 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 nature of marriage. <laughs> uh, you know, oh, let's I, get we need we need to get into yeah. that with the with the next right. book. Let's do let's do that. <laughs> so, cheap sex is followed up with by recently twenty twenty um, the future of Christian marriage. Uh, which is a, a study following upon this and, again, talks about, does some sociological studies uh, through multinational groups, uh, different age groups as well, and looks at the importance of, of Christian marriage and makes some predictions and some comments. And you'll nail down a bunch of, um, to me, I mean, there's just so much to talk about this book, but one of the first things to start with, the two things I'd like to, to start with are, one, the difference between a foundational and a capstone, yeah. understanding of marriage. Yeah. You nail that down. I think it makes it so clear because that's what everyone does that's how we live and how the transition. And then the two, the second one is, I think this is probably with your wife, about the expectations part. You have this fantastic quote, which I'll get after the foundation, the capstone one that I want to read. And I just love. Um, but so explain the, in the, the so you, you moved on to the future of Christian marriage in this book, yep. and you talked about the transition of marriage today. Just give us a sense of what's this, what's the difference between capstone understanding of marriage and foundations yeah. understanding of marriage yeah. more broadly? Yeah, I mean, all of these things, th that transition was enabled and uh, sort of jet powered by the uptake of the pill. You know, John Paul II talks about the uh, contraceptive mentality, right? Um, yes. That, you know, it, it almost means that people approach sexual relationship thinking sex is naturally infertile somehow, right? It's, it's yeah. really remarkable. Um, <laughs> I think women, you know, are more apt to remember that it's fertile, but I, yeah. I think men on average uh, approach it as if it's just, you know, that it's forgotten, right? It's like cognitively yeah. not present in the interaction. Um, okay. Uh, we talked about uh, uh, capstone and foundation. So foundational marriage was what most people had prior to probably the 1970s, 80s. Yeah. Uh, and some people still do, right? Uh, mm -hmm. When I married nearly 30 years ago, we basically formed a foundational marriage, which is a function in a large part of its timing, right? And mm -hmm. kind of yes. the, what, what people yes. were, are doing. Um, 
So if you marry, say, eh, probably prior to age 25-ish, you're probably enacting a foundational marriage. Certainly if you're marrying prior to 22 or 23. Yeah. Um, it's it. If you think about it, it's like you're entering this institution at the beginning of your sort of adult life course, right? And you know, well, we say, hey, you turn adult at eighteen, but you know, okay, some of this indicates like, well, marriage is fast becoming something that only college age people enter into, which is a, an entirely different story and a profound tragedy, right? Mm -hmm. And we don't reflect on this nearly enough. So uh, it's a foundation. You, know, you build your adulthood upon it and you accomplish things together. The fact that you're doing it at, say, 21, 22, 23, 24 means uh, there's going to be some turn taking. Right. And somebody's yes. pro somebody's uh, job is probably going to be more higher prioritized than somebody else's. And historically and typically that's. The, the man's job and the, the, the woman's uh, occupation vocation will be more likely to be mother, but not exclusively so. Sure. Um, a former graduate student of mine who's wildly successful uh, at, a, at a top five sociology program, they, they got married when they were 22, right? And mm -hmm. they've made it work, even though that's a foundational marriage and she's swimming in a, in a domain that doesn't respect that anymore. Yeah. So, uh, but the capstone, which you know, I didn't come up with that term. That was uh, Andy Churlam, sociologist at Johns okay. Hopkins. I mean, you think just think about it. Like the capstone is like the the pinnacle, the end the end of a construction project, right? Which is your adulthood, your young adulthood. Yeah. We marry when we are, you know, have are ready. We've uh, accomplished the things that we thought were necessary in order to become marriageable, and so then like. Yeah, it's almost like a, you know, a a peacock. We've we've mm -hmm. all of our feathers. We've got it all together, and then we strut and see who's you know who's interested, right? Yeah, it's a very different mentality than um, marrying when you're basically just a prospect. You know, I look back at my father-in-law, uh, like what did he <laughs> what did he see in me, right? You know? <laughs> yeah. At that time, I was going to become a, a, a Calvinist minister, which was Yikes. noble in his eyes, right? Yes, sure. Um, but he also, like, you know, I didn't have any income to bring to this thing. Yes. I've known other friends where, you know, they've gotten uh, some tough treatment from, fa you know, future father-in-laws, sure. you know, whether they're yeah. good enough, right? Yeah. I didn't get that mercifully. So, but, the, but now we approach our young adult years as like, oh, we have to prepare ourselves to be met. We have to earn our marriageability rather than you're marriageable from the get go. And yeah. then you go and do this thing, this project together. I mean, yes. both of them wind up in the same place, frankly. Um, although the more capstone marriages we do, the fewer marriages we're going to do because the longer people wait, the less likely some of them are to marry at all, which, uh, you know, I think about missed vocations yeah. to marriage and yes. I think it's, it's tragic and sad. And, and becoming more and more frequent. I also think, as you point out, um, it's less likely the marriages to stay together if the cat on the capstone model, uh, I, I, this, the capstone, once I read that and I saw this, it, it just struck me as absolutely correct and something important to, to notice today and to, to remind ourselves because it's such in the air, a capstone is just what you do now. Yeah. Um, because I was, I was, I was with a group of, of Catholics at, at a college I was teaching at Providence college. And, uh, one of them was a senior year. And one of the, the students that I was with had a, had a, a fake wedding ring on or something. It was to rain. And I, of course, was a senior. I, so I said, Oh, do you have anything to say to the, to the group, any announcement? And she, and she said, no, well, what? And I said, Oh, well, who's the lucky guy, you know, because 22 would be, I came from Calvinist background. So that, you know, senior year of college, but where else are you going to find a wife, you know, and the horror on her face and the other people in my group i mean all of them were like father you can't say that and i said what what would be so strange about her getting married I said, no but I, I she's gotta maybe when i'm 35 but i've got to get you know i've got to get my life together first and this like that was one of those gestalt switches when i realized that i yeah. there were just in different worlds that right. there is this idea that you have to be ready to marry in the sense of i well and that has the further aspect of like I have to succeed. And then I'll do that whole marriage and kid thing. 
oh, it's just vicious. It's yeah. horrible. Yeah. You know, it's absolutely horrible. Because you're yeah. in some sense, when are you ever going to succeed? Like, when are you ever going to be really ready to put a capstone on today? Especially with millennials yeah. who are just scared to death of everything. So I think yeah. you're you're abs- you're absolutely right. And it just struck me. The other thing about it though was um, it also put strange expectations on marriage. And this is the quote I will, I will read. And I just, maybe this is your, your wife uh, has something on this. This is page 12 <laughs> of, the, of the book. Um, it means men and women will be choosier and more apt to insist on a better fit because they can. For example, a woman wants to marry a conservative Christian who loves God more than he loves her. Fine. But she also expects him to sacrifice for her across a host of domains. He must work, want or not want children, support her career, co-parent with equality, listen to her with understanding, be her best friend, and defer to her interests when possible. This marriage, this is what so- social psychologist Eli Finkel has dubbed the suffocation model of marriage. Yeah. Yep. yeah. I, yep. Is that, that, that could be a, a matter of dispute here on this one? Like, this is, <laughs> uh, that's not the, the matter of dispute between her and me, but this is, okay. this is the case for, for much of the kind of capstone model. It's like, there are high, high expectations for it. I mean, everybody has it's elevated capstone. expectations for marriage, but like sure. they get higher with time because you mm. feel like, well, I've earned this kind of thing, right? Um, yeah. Uh, this is, you know, I didn't really go into it in, in the book, but, you know, the friendship is a, a pronounced good and it should remain so throughout adulthood because, you know, friends make everything easier. Like, yes, we want... Life. happy satisfying marriages but you know a good friend or two can help that along right yes necessary um, yeah so her and i dispute a little bit about sort of the uh the sort of the exchange nature of of marriage right <laughs> okay i don't know if, if, if it sounds because... a little transactional to her i suppose because you're a man <laughs> yeah, so, yeah you know and maybe it's, it's a, a, a gender thing um so but i, I look at sort of what happens in marriages. And mm-hmm. even if people wait to marry, they, they still enter and exhibit what becomes an exchange, right? Yes. She yes. does things that he's not good at, vice versa, and that they two of them sort of trade on what uh, their strengths and weaknesses, and it, and it works. People kind of dismiss it, thinking, oh, that's not how marriage is anymore. But, you know, yeah. if, it, if, it, if it isn't, I doubt that that's the case. Like, then they're saying, well, we're only trafficking on equal strengths, right? Fundamentally, which means nobody needs anybody, right? Uh, yes. I think all the ways that I need my wife and vice versa. And then, like, so we want to aspire to a, a scenario where nobody has to marry. If nobody has to marry, far, 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 far fewer people are going to. And yet, once they're in marriage, there is an exchange nature that emerges no matter what yes yeah and so it's just human i think i mean bartering trading experiences economic in the in these kind of adam mm-hmm. smith traditional sense not economic in the sense of the microeconomics kind of things but the fact that we're we're in a community with each other well, economics is just economics you could say the household economy um I think that's, I think that that's maybe, but I'm just a man. So maybe that makes, I think there's this, this idea. I like your point about that. The way we do capstone marriage, the way we think about marriage today makes it such that we aim that no one need to get married. And, uh, yeah. and that's just, and that's not profoundly d- dangerous to marriage, but dangerous to, of course, but dangerous to marriage, but to humans, because yeah. as Catholics and as, as humans, we believe that marriage is actually good for for those that that I, as a priest, as a religious priest, who have sac, I have taken a vow that is not like a different choice, but is sacrificing a certain good. Now I get other goods, and in fact, yeah. maybe even more goods. We could have a debate about that. Um, about even this in this world, you know, there's something. Sometimes when there's screaming children around, I think, praise Jesus, <laughs> praise Jesus. Um, but like it is, I it is a good to be. It's a human good and a natural good, and leading to supernatural good to be married. And so we lose a lot. And I think that's what you also you're you kind of strike a. I guess it's it's a warning sign in a way, saying, "Hey, we're all inclined to just swim along with the with the crowd." We say as Christians and as Catholics, "Oh, we believe something different about marriage," but actually, you might believe in the capstone model. 
It's just how it is. And you might believe in these expectation model and you might believe in all this stuff and you should be aware of that. Is that one of your, was one of your intentions is kind of a, Hey, let's take a check on this as Western Catholics and find out whether we actually committed to the institution or not. Right. There's a ton of things. Uh, I mean, sociology in some ways is kind of is meant to be a little bit of an unveiling to show people Mm -hmm. the the nature of reality. Now, (laughs) sociologists will radically different what they (laughs) see as realities these days. Sure. But that's somewhat uh, one of the things I, I, I enjoy writing about, uh, not to reveal for its own shocking val- value or anything mm-hmm. like that, but to, 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 to help people understand how it really is out there, right? This is why yes. you know, I, I, I privilege kind of a sense of realism. You know? Yes, I was going to say. I, I don't want ex- to operate in strictly in the, the realm of ideals. In fact, I don't spend a lot of time in the realm of ideals. People think I'm trying to smuggle in my values in the back door. Yeah. But not really, you know. I mean, I'm saying, be great if here you could, are, but here's no. what's going on out there. Are you? Yeah. Do you see these things, people? So yeah. Yes. Um. Well, um. We've only got a, a few minutes left, and but I want to, I want to give you the podium for um some I don't know some a fervorino you could say or a moral exhortation or maybe. You know, you don't need to be. We don't need to be hopeful about things. But what would you it, to a lot of our listeners? I suspect are younger, younger Catholics, um, but not everyone. But anyone who's interested in marriage, what do you think mm-hmm. from your from your reading on, in, from both these books? Which I hope all of our readers will will pick up. Um, they're they're very reasonable priced as well, so they're easy to easy to uh, to budget in, especially with Christmas. Um, what what would you like to say to to from your, from these studies to Catholics who are thinking about marriage? To be, you know, kind of careful about, or what do you encourage them to say? Hey, you might be missing this part. This is something I've discovered that yeah, you didn't do the sociology. Right. I did it for you. Uh, I'd say one of the things that comes to mind of late is, uh, you know, for men to kind of understand the, the, for lack of a better term, the privileged position they're at in this mating market system, mm-hmm. and to not you know, to consciously not traffic in that and to be mindful of the ways that they can be particularly helpful. Um, I was talking to, to a fellow the other day about sort of this kind of business. And I, I said, you know, do you remember in uh, A Hidden Life, that movie about Franz, mm-hmm. Franz Jagerstatter, he and his pals would sort of create this sort of uh, – weekend dances, I don't know, every, once a month or every couple of weeks. And they, it was on them to do that. And I, you know, I, I think dancing like that, I don't dance myself, never learned, hey, I'm a Dutch Calvinist, right? <laughs> yeah. um, but I thought, I mean, I've thought for the last decade, it's one of the best things that young people can do. Yes. And I, I thought, you know, put the onus back on men to start organizing some of these kinds of social uh events and venues but they have to want it because they seem increasingly content to just kind of sit back and consume partly because they can and they don't seem penalized for it or they're willing to be penalized for it for longer because they feel like oh, i've got plenty of time so it really the, the system kind of requires more proactivity mm-hmm. uh, on the part of men and women um, but women have been proactive in this domain uh, more often than men. And I, I kind of want to wake up men to sort of take some measure of, of, of activity in this domain for the sake of women and your, and your, and your friends. Yeah. I think that's, uh, that, that's, that's a good admonition to nobility that men, because there's something pathetic about being a pure consumer and right. I think every man right. who is told, when you realize, like in this with your sexual economics model, and realizing that actually your position is a dominant position of being a consumer, and there's something that seems deeply pathetic and tragic about right. being just a consumer. If you said someone you're just kind of a couch potato, or all you do is take, you know, yep. Um, yep. that men want to do things. We want to be. We want to take exactly. charge in things. And so to encourage they us won't to actually do it, they won't yes. do it unless it's demanded of them, unless they're called to do so. Right. Like we want to do hard things. Yes. We just look around us and we don't have to, which is a tough yeah. situation for them. Yes. No, it is. It's it's very tough. And I suppose 
This is on us as pastors too, uh, to preach and uh, to say things and fathers of children and, uh, and maybe even women, but again, it's tougher for women to, to exhort the men to do these, these sort of things, but other men, uh, that we can encourage one another and, and man up a bit. Um, again, this is a, a, well, I mean, we could talk about this forever, but Professor Regnerus, it was delightful to talk to you and you have lots to yep. say, and uh, you don't stay away from any of the controversy, as everyone knows already, um, which is great. It's very encouraging. It's a manly, I would say, courageous in a manly, uh, magnanimous kind of way of, of, of practicing the science of sociology. So I hope you'll get a number of students that won't say they're going to study under you, but will study under you, and there'll be an <laughs> army of JP2 uh, sociologists out there, which would be great. But thank you for, for joining us during this time and sharing uh, with your, your wisdom and your books with us. You're welcome, Father. It's a happy to be here. Okay. Thanks to listening to this episode of God Splaining, Guest Splaining, special episode. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, or whatever these things are. Like, subscribe, leave a five star, six star, seven star, Regnera star review. If you'd like to donate to the podcast through Patreon, follow the link in the description. You can also follow the links to the description to shop God Splaining merch, whatever. To get information on upcoming God Splaining events, please do go and look up Professor Mark Regnerus. Um, to find his books, Cheap Sex and the Future of Christian Marriage. And also you can find information on his website. Uh, it's really beautiful and has lots of information to, about marriage and relationships with men and women, which are just the thing that really matters other than past God and leading to God is really important. So thank you again, Professor Regneris. Know uh, anyone, everyone listening that we're praying for you and please pray for us. And we'll catch you next time on God's Point. Mm-hmm.